Okay, hello. Uh, thank you all for joining us for our third uh, session uh, on uh, the history of social democracy uh, in Europe. Um, we're joined today, uh, we're very fortunate to be joined today by Jorge Tamames. Uh, he's uh, an analyst at the Real Instituto del Cano and a PhD candidate at the University College Dublin. Um, and he's written extensively. Uh, his writing has appeared in El País, Jacobin, and The New Statesman. Um, and I'm also joined by Chris Maizano, as always, um, who's going to uh, ask a few questions. Um, so I guess, Jorge, uh, it would be great to start with kind of the early um, history of the 20th century uh, in Spain. Um, and uh, I'm interested in kind of the development of the social democratic tradition in Spain, uh, particularly in light of the civil war that we have uh, between 1936 and 39, um, how the civil war kind of sets up the political context uh, in which leftism in Spain emerges and kind of transforms. Right, well, uh, thanks to both for having me here. It's a, it's a big pleasure. Um, so I'll, I'll try to answer your, your question as, as briefly or accurately as I can without uh, getting into like a very sprawling uh, depiction. But basically the, the issue with uh, the Socialist Party in Spain as in other Southern European countries, uh, think for example, Greece and Portugal, is that unlike um, the, the sort of uh, your, your standard image of a central left party in maybe a country like Germany or the United Kingdom, they don't go through the sort of like post-war era of like a golden social democratic capitalism, right? Because Spain at the time is a dictatorship uh, from 1939 to 1975. Uh, it's under the heel of a right-wing dictator, Francisco Franco, who basically is a, is a military officer and he wins a, a civil war uh, fought by sort of his... his uh, nationalist uh, side right uh, with the backing of, of the sort of the hierarchy of the catholic church and the army and sort of like the, the you know big landowners and support from germany and italy in the context of uh, you know right before world war ii uh, and he wins against the sort of like the on the other side is is a very loose coalition um around the second spanish republic which goes all the way from sort of uh, your your uh, left uh, liberal republicans to to socialist right the socialist party in spain is the oldest party in the country it was formed in the 1870s um, to sort of uh, the, the communists that break away from the Socialist Party at the time and the anarchists, right? Uh, Spain has a particularity that it had a very strong anarchist tradition uh, in the early 20th century, which divided into the sort of uh, the, the, the agrarian anarchists in southern Spain and the sort of more like anarcho-syndicalist tradition in places like Barcelona. Um, so, so PSOE is sort of part of this coalition, but, but uh, at the time, it is sort of uh, being torn by the same contradictions that ravage other center left parties in Europe, right? So there is a faction that is uh, for uh, sort of like more explicit support and alignment with the Soviet Union. Um, and there's another party that is sort of like will eventually become sort of uh, more anti communist and sort of, uh, you know, um, left liberal, I guess you could say, right? And these, these contradictions play out not just within the PSOE, but also between different factions in the Civil War, right? So very famously, the, the communists and the anarchists have very different uh, ideas of the way they want to wage the war. And that coupled with the fact that uh, they have uh, weaker international sponsors, right? So the Soviet Union is uh, very tepid in support of, of, um, of the Republic in comparison to the sort of like full-throated support of, of Italy and Germany, Nazi Germany to, to the right wing. Um, and with uh, France and uh, the UK adopting a sort of like non-intervention position that in the end uh, benefits the sort of nationalist bloc, uh, they lose the war, right? Uh, and so they go into exile. And PSOE spends uh, most of the time in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s in its exile, mainly in France and Mexico, um, and they really don't do much, right? So uh, at this time, during the Franco dictatorship, uh, Franco basically stays in place because after the Second World War and at the beginning of the Cold War, he gets uh, support from the United States, right? They want to use Spain for sort of uh, strategic depth in case there is a sort of a Soviet invasion of continental Europe and they install American bases there. And they, so they give Franco their support. Franco is in there for, for the long haul until his death in 1975. And it falls upon the Communist Party to be the leading sort of party of the clandestine opposition. Um, Pessoa at this time doesn't really do much, right? So it's in a sort of hibernation period, right? Um, in, in 1979, they they uh, during the, the general elections, they have this um, the slogan that says, you know, Pessoa, 100 years of, of honesty, I believe it is, right? Uh, and, and then uh, um, a communist leader quipped, yeah, 100 years of, of honesty and 40 of holidays, right? Because they didn't do anything during the dictatorship. 
Um, interestingly enough, they, they managed to compensate for this sort of absence during the Franco years. Um, and then they eventually become the, the hegemonic party, uh, not just of the left, but of the Spanish political party system in the 1980s. And, and we can talk a bit about that if you want to. Um, I, yeah, hearing that history, Jorge, something that jumps out at me is it seems like it might be useful to compare the development of the, the Spanish left with, say, the Italian left. Uh, you know, the Italian left is uh, kind of unique in, uh, say, a generally Western European context in, in which, you know, it's the, the Communist Party uh, that emerges as the leading force on the left, uh, you know, to a significant extent because of the role it plays, uh, you know, in, in the resistance. Uh, during the war and its general opposition to the, the fascist dictatorship there. So, yeah, my, my question then is, why is it that in a place like Italy, which in certain respects, at least, I think is somewhat similar to, to Spain, um, why is it that the Communist Party emerges as the leading force on the left uh, in Italy, uh, but it's the pe uh, PSOE that, that does this uh, in Spain, even though it didn't seem to play any kind of like leading or important role in the resistance to Franco? Right. I mean, it's a very interesting question. And they, it's a question that was posed to sort of one of the leading uh, political scientists of the Spanish transition, Juan Lins, uh, before Franco died. And he was asked, what will be the leading parties of a democratic party, uh, of a democratic system in Spain after Franco, right? And he said, well, there will be like a, a big a Christian democratic party on the right and a sort of a communist party on the left, similar to Italy, right? Uh, and this never happened. Uh, there was, there was uh, you know, the, the communist party never overtook PSOE. And in the right, there was never a, a sort of like a originally Christian Democratic Party comparable to those of the other European countries in their center right. Um, so essentially, uh, uh, and what happens is, um, so as you know, Italy has a sort of a very reformist communist party, right? They sort of have this uh, Euro communist road to power uh, and, and this, the communist party in Spain eventually uh, adopts this strategy too, right? But um, to, to explain it very simply, what happens is uh, for a long time, the, the Communist Party in Spain works with a sort of uh, wrong strategic hypothesis of what is going to happen after Franco dies, right? So the Communist Party this time is, is and I'm, I'm simplifying this story very much, but it's divided between the leadership in exile and the people that were clandestinely in Spain, right? Uh, and so the first 20 years of Francoism are, are a disaster for the dictatorship. The, the, the economy tanks, uh, they try to do this sort of autarkic, economic policy that doesn't work. Uh, but beginning in 1959, things begin to change, right? So first they get US support um, in, in the context of the Cold War, but also then in terms of foreign direct investment, the, the dictatorship sort of uh, adopts a new economic development strategy, right? Sort of like developmentalist strategy in the 1960s that leads the Spanish economy to grow at an immense pace, right? I think at the, in this decade, it's like second only to Japan in terms of its economic boom, right? And so this begins to change the structure of Spanish society. And this is what the people who are working clandestinely in South of Spain uh, in the Communist Party start telling the leadership, which is that, look, you're, you're working with this sort of hypothesis that when Franco dies, there's going to be a revolutionary situation, like the one that takes place in Portugal, right? Where there is no economic boom and where the army is fighting the colonial wars and then it revolts and the army by then is like full of, of communist and socialist officers. But the people working clandestinely tell, tell the leadership, no, no, this is not going to happen because um, this decade of economic growth is, is not making, uh, you know, it, it's not making the dictatorship legitimate, but it's certainly making people um, understand their position in society in different terms, right? Uh, and, you know, what you're going to find out is you're going to have to do a much more reformist approach uh, to the situation rather than just expect to, to take power, right? Uh, so, so the leadership at the time doesn't believe that these warnings. Uh, and then when by the time they see it's actually happening, it's sort of too late, right? Because Franco dies, uh, they initially appoint a guy who is like a su successor in his line. He has to resign and they put in this guy, Alonso Suarez, who used to be a leader of the fascist movement, but it's just basically um, a, a total opportunist and a very smart political operator. And he realizes there's a need to reform Spain in a democratic direction. Um, and he starts to do this actually pretty boldly, right? Uh, to the point where, where it's the, the hard right and the remnants of the Franco regime that begin uh, having a real problem with him. Uh, but of course, this leaves the, the communists out of, uh, you know, that's the, their, their, um, the position they were expecting to play suddenly disappears, right? And Suarez actually wins the first democratic elections with sort of around 34% of the vote, right? And the communist party getting 10%. Um, so then they are forced to recalibrate. And what they do is they try to do this sort of your communist strategy of um, reaching agreements with the center right, right? Uh, they are um, 
closely linked to the leading union in Spain at this time, Comisiones Obreras, Workers' Commissions, which is formed clandestinely. And they sort of set out on a sort of uh, strategy of economic concertation. Uh, but this then allows, uh, paradoxically, the socialists to sort of outflank them from the left every now and then, right? Uh, because they are the ones bearing the brunt for the normalization of the democratic opposition. So the communists do things like they, they accept uh, the monarchy, right? A parliamentary monarchy. They accept the sort of uh, flag of the Franco regime without the Francoist emblems, but they, they refuse reinstating all the political traditions linked to the Second Republic. And so they also bear the brunt for these decisions. Um, but mostly I think is that for a long time, they, they work with the, with the sort of wrong hypothesis, right? And then their leader is very closely associated to the civil war. So Santiago Carrillo was from the Socialist Party, that is from the faction that breaks away and forms the Communist Party. Um, he was involved in like uh, the, the, the um, evacuation of Madrid and a sort of a, a series of massacres that take place of, of uh, nationalist prisoners and in Paracuellos. And so he is very much associated with uh, sort of the, the, the old days of the Civil War, right? And one of the consequences of the, the decade of economic growth is this sort of to an extent, sort of depoliticization of Spanish society where people are doing a bit better and they don't want to uh, relitigate the civil war, right? And I think in this regard, uh, paradoxically, PSOE is having been out of the picture for, for 30 years, something that becomes beneficial for them, right? They have a new face, they have a very charismatic leadership, uh, they have like the feeling of, of, of a new period starting and not sort of going back to the old uh, days before uh, the dictatorship where we had a civil war. Just to uh, maybe elaborate a bit on on the Franco period, um, I'm interested to hear kind of how Franco's rule, and particularly during this period of growth in the 60s and 70s, or 60s mainly, um, how that kind of structured the country's uh, welfare infrastructure um, and labor movement. Uh, you mentioned that, you know, uh, Comisiones Obreros was operating clandestinely. Um, what kind of uh, labor movement was taking place under Franco if there was one? Um, and how was the kind of economic infrastructure of the country set up? Um, and, and yeah, what kind of economic infrastructure did the PSOE inherit? Um, when it came into power. Right. So, I mean, it, it's a fascinating question and a big one. So, but basically where I would start is a, Spain is like one of the few countries that has like in this period goes from like, manages to avoid the sort of like middle income trap, right? Which is what many countries that they develop uh, uh, to a certain point and then they can't go beyond being a sort of like middle income country, right? Uh, Spain becomes throughout like, for, you know, starting in the 1959 and going all the way to the 1990s, a sort of um, advanced capitalist economy, right? And that's uh, how it's usually termed. Um, and it really begins in 1959 when, when the dictatorship, you know, it, originally what they do is they have um, this sort of um, fascist led autarkic idea of development, right? The, the labor movement is tied to the sort of unions that the, the fascists create, but of course these are, uh, very closely linked to the Franco regime. So they're not really, uh, you know, in, in spite of the more revolutionary uh, elements of, of uh, fascist rhetoric, they are not really very combative, right? Uh, and so what happens is in, in, in the 1960s, you have this enormous uh, spike in development, right? Uh, at this time is when uh, Comisiones Obreras, the, the Workers' Commission begins to develop, uh, mostly clandestinely, right? Um, eventually we'll have two leading unions. One is uh, Workers' Commissions, the one I'm talking about, and the other is UGT, which is the General Union of Workers, which is the traditionally the Socialist Party's union arm, right? So these disappear after the Civil War, right? They're outlawed and they come back um, after a transition to democracy. Um, so now in terms of the, the structuring of the welfare state, the, the, the short answer would be there is no structure because there's no welfare state, right? So so the the Franco, like his technocrats, right? It's like the, the guys who are like the more liberal ministers that were linked to, to um, Opus Dei, they're very successful in promoting economic growth. Um, but at some point they realize they're not gonna be able to develop a modern welfare state like uh, other European countries do, right? So there are a few of them within the regime who are interested in doing this. Uh, and they look at uh, France uh, under the goal as a model to follow, right? Because France at this time has, uh, uh, of course, a capitalist economy, but one that is uh, heavily directed by the state, right? You have five-year plans that is called indicative planning, right? And the state really like sets the goal for economic development and has a, a very strong footprint in the economy and in society that plays a, a directing role. Um, and, you know, these guys are sort of like, you know, they, they come from Opus Dei, but they have this sort of like, you know, social view of, of, of 
you know, there's a kind of like social Christianism and this idea that like, oh, you know, maybe it could be good. Like they're, they're of course very anti-communist, but they think this could be something that, that works for Spain. But what they, what they find out is um, basically the Franco state doesn't exert the amount of fiscal pressure that you would need to have like a successful developmental state of these portions, right? Because there's premise on really not taxing highly uh, the victors of the civil war or um, among others, um, economic elites, right? And big landowners. And so I think that the figure is something like um, fiscal pressure at this point never goes beyond 22% uh, of GDP, right? In Franco Spain, which is a very low number. Like you need like twice that amount if you're expecting to do serious uh, economic developmentalism where the state actually not just uh, directs economic growth, but also provides wealth. Uh, and so the welfare state is really underdeveloped. Um, and this is something that is very interesting because like the socialists, when they get to power, uh, even as they adapt to neoliberalism, they will be the ones who uh, effectively develop the welfare state. So in terms of sequencing, it works very differently from other European cases where it's you know the left that develops these programs in the 1940s after World War II. Uh, in Spain, the timing is entirely different. How does this compare to other um, social democracies in other post-dictatorship countries, like say Portugal, right next door, uh, or Greece? Um, if memory serves, it's a similar sort of situation in which you know these are countries coming out of a dictatorship, lower levels of capitalist development, not much in the way of a modern welfare state, uh, and then these social democratic parties take over uh, after the dictatorship and. and begin to to build something of a modern welfare state. So yeah, what are some of the similarities and differences between what uh, PSOE uh, is trying to do in Spain during this time and what happens uh, in Portugal and Greece as those countries also are coming out of dictatorships? So I think like in terms of economic policymaking, the interesting comparison of is Portugal. Uh, Greece I know a little bit less of, but um, so basically there are two main differences, right? And here I'm, I'm working with the um, work of a, um, political scientist in Spain, Robert Fishman, was on like a lot of really interesting comparative research between um, Spain and Portugal, right? So um, basically what, what he ties a lot of the distinction to and, and the structure, the economic structure of the two countries is the pathway to democratization. In Spain, it's reformist and in Portugal, in Portugal it's revolutionary. Now in Portugal, there's a revolution for two main reasons. One, um, the, the dictatorship is a extremely orthodox when it comes to the economy, right? Uh, extraordinarily conservative, and they never do this sort of like developmentalist strategy. So uh, Portugal becomes like a, a, an absolute economic laggard. And on top of that, you had the colonial wars, right? Um, and so like the, the sort of discontent that this generate eventually leads to a, a revolutionary situation, right? Um, in the transition to democracy, the dictator, the, the, you know, the, the heir of Salazar, uh, Caetano, he has to take a plane to Brazil. Uh, you have images of the, uh, the, 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 the dictatorship police, right? The PIDE, the secret police, they are outed in the streets and publicly humiliated. Um, if you were a leading professor in university, but you're close to the regime, which we're likely to be, right? If you had risen through the ranks, your students would like publicly humiliate you the day after the revolution, right? So there was a, an absolute inversion of hierarchies. In Spain, that doesn't happen. Uh, Franco dies peacefully in bed. And the transition, although it's a reformist process, actually more people died because you have uh, remnants of the Franco regime killing people. You have the terrorist group in the north of Spain, ETA, that also like keeps killing even after there's like a, a return to democracy. Um, and so, so one of the leading feelings uh, uh, throughout this period is fear, right? People are really, it's not sort of like an emancipatory outbreak of revolution, but people are really scared that, that each step taken towards democratization might lead to a backlash from, from the hardliners in the regime, right? We're, we're always there. Uh, and so, you know, basically uh, it's very interesting because even though the socialist party was in Spain in power for a longer time, um, and you could argue this has to do with the fact that uh, part of the right wing party comes out of the Franco's dictatorship really without reforming itself. And it takes them about two decades to become more moderate uh, sort of catch all party. Uh, in Spain, uh, in Portugal, that doesn't happen, right? Because even the right wing doesn't come from, uh, they were not tied institutionally to the dictatorship. Uh, but paradoxically, the, the center left in Spain, even though it's hegemonic for a very long time, is a sort of more conservative party, or this is what Fishman claims than, than in Portugal. Uh, and he, he basically looks at what he calls democratic practice, but this is a rubric under which he examines a lot of things. So for example, the structuring of the welfare state, the inclusion of women in the workforce. And you find that in Portugal, even though on paper, it's sort of a, like a poorer country than Spain, right? Um, and in the comparative literature on transitions to democracy, it's not successful. I uh, realized it actually has uh, much more inclusive results than Spain, right? 
Um, now, you, you could argue whether that's still the case after the, the austerity years and the crises. Um, maybe it doesn't hold uh, on so well, but, but this is the, one of the first consequences, right? Um, I think, you know, it, it, really the, the pathway to democratization makes a, a, a big footprint, right? And this generates sort of like these path dependent dynamics that then reinforce themselves. But I think at this point, um, you could also look at like more recent developments and take these into consideration as well, right? So, so the way the 2008 crisis affected each country, uh, Portugal, of course, had a more, um, a stronger intervention from, from the Troika in terms of a, a full bailout and Spain did not, it had a partial one and so forth. Um, I did want to talk about, um, yeah, this this context in which uh, Gonzalez comes in power um, and these kind of dual mandates that he has. On the one hand, yeah, building a welfare state where a welfare state doesn't exist. Um, on the other hand, he's coming into power in this context in which, you know, Thatcher and Reagan and everyone has already kind of entered the picture. Um, and, you know, what what does the Socialist Party do? between this kind of international environment and this kind of domestic uh, task that it has before it? Uh, what are the kind of ideologies that it that it adopts? Right, so basically like it, it's, you know, it's a fascinating story because it goes back to the 70s, which are sort of a pivotal decade, right? Uh, now we look at the 70s as sort of the onset of neoliberalism, right? Because that's how it ended. Um, but at the beginning of the decade, there are some, some very revolutionary proposals from, from coming from center left parties and, and Peso is one of them, right? So, so Peso during this time is, is led until the mid nineties um, by, by Felipe Gonzalez, who is the president of the government and sort of the leader of Peso and his right-hand man, Alfonso Guerra, who is the sort of like the party whip, right? Who is the one who's in control of the party. Um, of course, there are other very important figures, but these are the sort of the two, the, the iconic duo, right? Uh, interestingly, when they take over the party, from the sort of the socialist old guard who is uh, still in France and they haven't been doing much uh, throughout the dictatorship. Um, they sort of uh, come at them from the left, right? And they, and they accuse them of, of being passive, of being overly concerned with being uh, with, with the Communist Party, right? And that their anti-communism is counterproductive and that they need to be more proactive and more, uh, you know, more present in the, the clandestine opposition against uh, Francoism, right? Um, this goes on until the the pretty much the, the late seventies, right? So so even before Franco dies, they have a, a big Congress, big party convention where uh, Gonzalez and his team really uh, are, are like elected to lead the party. And, and some of the the proposals that come out of this uh, convention are very interesting to read today because they're very radical, right? So so the economic policies are very radical. Uh, they 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 are in favor of having self determination referendums in some regions of Spain that might want to uh, break away from the country because they have different um, distinct uh, national and uh, cultural trajectory, uh, like Catalonia and the Basque Country. Uh, eventually, these these uh, they really moderate down their proposals, right? Um, but when the Communist Party is still uh, powerful, they have uh, no qualms about sort of outflanking it from the left, right? Even as the Communist Party is sort of like, as I described before, bearing the brunt for like normalizing relationships in this reformist democratization process. So, um, Beginning in, in, by the late 70s, the, the communists are no longer a threat in terms of becoming the hegemonic party of the left. The, the socialists are far ahead of them electorally. Uh, and they begin pivoting towards the center. So one of the things they do internally is they decide, uh, and here's where it's interesting to compare the difference between PSOE as a social democratic European party and a party like the Democrats in the United States. So PSOE at this time still has uh, in its official statutes, Marxism as its guiding ideological tenet, right? And so there ensues a big discussion about whether they should have it there or they should just keep Marxism as an analytical tool, which is what they eventually do, right? This part of an operation of like sort of normalizing the party's appeal. Now, what's interesting is um, the kind of actors that they rely upon to conduct this normalization process, right? So throughout the 70s, um, they are uh, supported by other central left social democratic parties in Europe. But these parties don't have the same strategic outlook. So for example, in France, uh, the Socialist Party at the time has this sort of like common program with the uh, Communist Party that they eventually put into practice in the early 1980s. It's very radical. They nationalize entire sectors of the economy. They try to reflate the economy uh, through public investment, uh, through having a larger public sector, and it eventually doesn't work, right? But in the 70s, this is the strategy that they are prioritizing. Now, uh, for example, the Social Democratic Party in Germany uh, they don't have, they have a very different outlook. Uh, they are not interested in dealing with the communists. 
And their idea is that um, instead of doing all this, like, you know, these nation nationalization policies and whatnot, we actually have a, a, a recipe for uh, managing the economy around more orthodox ways with less public spending, with concertation with unions, um, with, with a independent and prestigious central bank that will keep inflation in check. Um, and what happens is throughout the 70s, uh, the Social Democratic Party of Germany becomes much more influential than the French one or this way for two main reasons. One is that they're in power in Germany, right? So they have much more resources, whereas the uh, French left only comes to power in the 1980s. The other one is in the 1970s, this is a decade of, of stagflation, right? Rising inflation, rising unemployment. And West Germany is seen as the time as the only European country that manages to square the circle, right? Because they have this strongly independent central bank and they were never really big into sort of these like big Keynesian stimulus programs, they managed to avoid inflation and they come out as sort of the, the, the winner of the decade, right? They sort of like, the model uh, for successful European capitalism. So, you know, the, the, the socialists, you know, Gonzalez and his people, they look at this and they see a way of, uh, you know, having macroeconomic stability, but also sort of like upholding a certain uh, social democratic ethos, right? Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is internally, they develop a very strong network of experts. So it's very interesting. If you look, for example, at the work of uh, the sociologist Stephanie Munch in her work on central left parties, she identifies this figure, the sort of Keynesian theorist, as a guy who was, a, you know, an economist that was linked to professional academia, but also to political parties of the central left, and then to the labor union, right? The labor union movement because they had worked in their think tanks and whatnot. So they could intermediate between the words of uh, worlds of academia, politics, and organized labor. Pessoa during this time develops a different kind of expert who is also strongly linked to academia and to the socialist party, but the third. Uh, you know, world that they connect to is the world of uh, central banking and finance. They come from the Bank of Spain, the central bank, and their sort of um, research service, which is very influential at this time, right? Uh, so in this configuration, it's labor that becomes excluded, organized labor. And in fact, PSOE, and we can talk about this further on if you want, throughout the 1980s, uh, eventually relationships with this union are break down, right? And, and they come to have a very, they, they eventually end up having a very contested relationship with the labor. So the thing is, they, they come and, and you know, the, their official accounts is that they say, look, we, we come to power in 1982. We saw what the French were trying to do in terms of pumping up the economy through the public sector, and it didn't work. And because we saw this, it was a process of, of social learning, right? We saw this didn't work, and we said, we're not going to try it ourselves. Uh, Keynesianism in one country in the context of economic recession will not work. Uh, so instead, we do go the German way. But in fact, they had decided on the German way before uh, the, the, the French really embarked on their path, right? And there's uh, increasing research that suggests that they had taken the decision before because they were more convinced by this uh, model of German development. Now, the question is, you know, and, and within the Spanish left, it's very common to just lambast them as, oh, well, they were neoliberal. But the thing is, they are, uh, they do adapt the Spanish economy to a neoliberal world, but they do at the same time as they, they build the welfare state in Spain, right? Because of what I was explaining before, there was not a welfare Spain, uh, a welfare state at the time. So they have compensatory mechanisms, right? They have ways of compensating the losers of economic transformation, right? I mean, a good example that you can compare with the US right now is for example, the, the mining sector in Northern Spain, right? A lot of miners, uh, they, they are laid off and there's like industrial conflict there, but uh, most of them get like very good compensatory schemes. It's not, they're not just laid off and, and told to go learn how to code, right? How the way the Democrats uh, suggest uh, they do in, in Kentucky or whatever. So, so there's clearly a difference there and, and they really have the instruments to smoothen the process and adjust it. So they eventually end up with a, a country that is um, integrated into a neoliberal world, but PSOE paradoxically retains a sort of like um, base of support within the working class in Spain, right? And in fact, it is, it is more so middle-class voters that begin defecting the party in the 1990s. So, so it's, an, it's an interesting story because it's full of ambiguities. Uh, another thing that happens during this time, um, and I think this is probably related um, to the influence that German social democracy and kind of German economic policy in general has on, on the PSOE and on, on Spain in general during this period, is the fact that Spain joins the European economic community, um, you know, the, kind of the precursor to the, to the European Union uh, in the mid-1980s, as did um, Portugal uh, and, and Greece as well. Um, so how did joining the EEC affect uh, the development of Spanish social, social democracy during this time uh, and its general approach to political and economic strategy in Spain? Right. Well, I mean, that's a question to which there are many 
different and diverging answers, right? So because today and after the, the especially after the austerity policies, the EU uh, within the left and in many European countries is seen as a synonym of neoliberalism, right? And the idea is, well, once Spain decided to join the, uh, the EU, then the European Economic Community, um, you know, it had to basically sell off uh, part of its industrial base, become a, uh, an economy dominated by the service sector, um, adapt to neoliberalism as a, as a part and parcel of becoming a member of the European economic community. Now, uh, so there is some truth to that story, but I think mostly it's because you there, there, there are parts where you're just like projecting the state of the EU today and projecting it backwards, right? Um, really the decision to embark on this sort of orthodox stabilization strategy comes from PSOE first. There's nobody in Brussels at the time saying this is what you have to do, right? It's a decision that is taken by the Socialist Party of Spain to, to embark on this particular course of economic action. Um, so that's the first thing, right? Uh, the second one is that even though, and this becomes clear in the 1990s when there's, you know, the European Monetary Union and the Maastricht Treaty means that you're become, uh, you know, you, you want to join the euro and then you have like some, some very clear constraints on what you can do fiscally. Uh, and of course, you don't no longer have a monetary policy, right? Because it's going to be led by the European Central Bank and Frankfurt, Germany. But before that, um, in the 1980s, especially uh, when, when Spain joins the European Economic Community, again, it's a similar story to the uh, PSOE um, case that I was illustrating before, where yes, this is part and parcel of joining a neoliberal world, but at the time it also offers you compensatory mechanisms, right? So one of them is the structural funds, right? So the EU destines uh, sort of like investment funds, to its uh, more less economically developed member states, right? And Spain at the time is one of the poorer ones. So it immediately gets a lot of funding in terms of um, structural funds that it uses to develop a sort of like more modern infrastructure service and whatnot. So, so again, here you have also this ambiguity where yes, this is part of like Spain uh, becoming sort of joining a neoliberal world, but um, it's it's not exactly just a, a punishing strategy. Like it begin like uh, for example in the austerity years, right? So you clearly have advantages of joining the, the common market and, and you get structural funds. And so you can use these to provide for compensation for the losers of economic transformation. Going back to the relationship between the PSOE and uh, the labor movement, I when you were speaking, I remembered that uh, when I interviewed Felipe Gonzalez for my uh, book uh, last year or two years ago, um, he told me that the way that he saw it was that he was trying to build this kind of universal benefit system and the unions were fighting against him to keep benefits uh, tied to them. And so he had this very kind of, um, you know, self-congratulatory uh, vision of, of what he was trying to do. Um, and I'm interested in, in your response to that, um, to what degree uh, was why did the PSOE develop such a kind of hostile relationship to the labor movement, uh, especially, you know, the UGT, uh, Comisiones Obreros, I guess, makes a bit more sense because they're affiliated to the Communist Party. But uh, why do relationships between the UGT and uh, PSOE decline like this? And why this kind of effort to uh, take uh, power over benefits uh, away from the unions? Right. Well, I, I really enjoyed that uh, that conversation in the Phenomenal World uh, series. Uh, like the whole volume is very good. Uh, there's also a fascinating anecdote in which Adam Jaworski is in, in southern Spain in the 1990s when Pessoa is still winning elections and he goes to a big Pessoa rally, right? And then one of the militants is just like, they, they all look like they're super disappointed and he doesn't really explain. He says, well, you've been winning for 10 years and you're going to still win elections. What's the matter? And he says, you know, they they took away from us the language that we used, right? Like the, the language that they speak is no longer on, which is very poignant to me. Uh, because Pessoa at this time is a party that talks about modernization, about, you know, leaving behind the years of the backward dictatorship, joining other European countries, you know, like uh, the, the place that was due to Spain at this time, but we couldn't have because of Francoism. But this is not really the rhetoric of the left, right? And I think this is what this militant was expressing. Um, now, regard, it's funny, like that, that argument by Felipe González is one that is lobbied against labor unions in Spain very often, which is that Spain has a strongly dualized labor market, right? There's a big difference whether you have like a position that is covered by a union and that has job security or whether you're sort of out there in the precarious economy where you can be fired any day, you have no job stability and whatnot, right? And so this is usually, this is very often used by people who are, uh, you know, who, who, who are opposed unions 
um, to say, well, you know, unions only care about protecting the insiders, not, not the outsiders of the labor market, right? But the first thing you'd have to say is like, well, yeah, that's a labor market that Pessoa constructed uh, through his 14 years in office. They could have adopted a very different legislation if they chose to do so. Uh, so that's the first thing, right? Now, the second thing is, um, why do relationships uh, between between Pessoa and its union arm break down? And they're, they're diverging accounts. But um, the one that convinces me the most is the following. So um, as you know, in, in the, so there is, uh, throughout the post-war period, there is this sort of relationship, inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment, right? The idea is if you have like no unemployment, you have a little bit of inflation. And in the post-war years, this is considered acceptable because inflation is bad for asset holders in the financial sector, as long as it's not, you know, as long as it's moderate inflation. But, uh, you know, ultimately for the whole society, it's worse to have like spiking unemployment. Now, this relationship breaks down in the 1970s. And when you join the neoliberal world, what you have effectively is a priority of, of price stability. So now the, the question is keeping inflation low. Uh, and if there's some employment, well, that's something we'll have to deal with. A consequence of this sort of uh, economic model that the PSOE implements in Spain is it had very high structural unemployment, extraordinarily high for US standards. So in Spain, even at the height of the real estate bubble, when the economy was booming, unemployment was 8%. That's the lowest it has been um, since the 1980s. So it's always double digit, right? Um, and throughout this period, they're like, they are really concerned with keeping inflation low. Now, there are two ways of doing that. You can do that through monetary policy, which is like the harder way and, and uh, targeting inflation um, interest rates. Or you can have like social agreements uh, between sort of like the employer organizations, labor unions and the government. Right. Um, it's a classic like social democratic way of having like a you know, negotiated capitalism. And they do this at first, uh, but eventually they just opt to to not deal with the unions now. Uh, part of the explanations or the, the sort of like the, the explanation that portray Pessoa in a better light say, well, it has to do with the fact that Spain had two leading unions, so they want to outbid each other, right? So for the Pessoa union arm to be constantly defending the government really makes it look weak, right? And so it had to like outbid the other uh, workers commission, the, the other leading union, right? So they were in this competition, they're bidding more and they're demanding more than the government could, could provide. Now, um, I, I find a, a second explanation more compelling, which is that uh, the institutional configuration of the relationship between PSOE and UGT, its union, was developed in such a way that it gave uh, PSOE absolute power over the union, right? So uh, here in the work of Sebastián Royo, um, he's a professor at Boston, and he does, uh, conducts comparative case studies with other European countries, and he finds out that, um, for example, um, the, the union had very few seats compared to other uh, center-left parties in the party executive. Right. Um, the union economic teams are never as uh, technically uh, well versed as the technical teams that the economy, the, the government can marshal. There's, these are the guys that come from the financial sector that I was talking about before. Right. The Bank of Spain. So they have like the, the um, epistemic firepower. Right. They have the, the, the leading experts. They have a, a party union links that are configured in such a way that PSOE can effectively bail on its promises to UGT and not pay any consequences uh, politically, right? So, so the historic leader of UGT at this time, Nicolás Redondo, he becomes sort of like a, a castaway within PSOE. He was like one of the leading uh, figures there, but uh, you know, the, the leadership doesn't pay a high price for this. Um, so basically this all comes down to, and, you know, that comes to a, a, a point in, in 1988 when there is a general strike, right? After PSOE has been in power for six years and UGT joins workers' commissions and, and sort of effectively breaks with the government. There's a general strike. The government is caught flat-footed. They have to go back on many of the, the sort of like the reforms that they wanted to apply on labor and they couldn't. They eventually come back with a vengeance on the unions in the 1990s, but they have to backtrack, right? And from then onwards, the relationship is very contested. So for me, this raises a, an interesting question, Jorge, which is how does PSOE manage to keep its working class base in the 90s and the 2000s? and keep winning elections while it's pursuing this kind of antagonistic or at least very tense and fraught relationship uh, with the labor movement and, you know, particularly with the trade union confederation that's at least nominally affiliated with it. How, how does this work? Because it seems like this sort of situation in many other countries resulted in uh, the fragmentation, uh, the detachment of the traditional working class base from kind of the, the main uh, social democratic or labor party. So. How does this work in Spain? Why this seems to be something of a unique case or a unique situation? 
Well, uh, Chris, if I, if I had an answer to your question, I wouldn't be here. I'll be finishing my PhD thesis, which seeks to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't found one yet, okay? Uh, but it's a fascinating, it's certainly a fascinating story. Uh, but, um, and so it can't just be a question. We look at it comparative that uh, people are fooled into voting for a party that's not good for them, right? There have to be other explanations. Um, so one of them has to do with what I was describing before, this sort of compensatory strategy, right? If if you come from a world like other uh, European countries, so the glorious 30 years of post-war social democracy, right? And you saw the Labour Party build the welfare state like it did in, in the United Kingdom, uh, then sort of like what, what a party like PSOE does in Spain in the 1980s, what of course generated its voters a lot of conflict. But in Spain, you come from an entirely different perspective and background, right? Uh, you didn't have a welfare state. So then, for example, even while they're doing this and they have a bad relationship with the worker movement or like an increasingly sour relationship, they are providing all the welfare infrastructure. They are modernizing the country. They are uh, to an extent delivering um, for their electorate, right? Which even after the breakup with Duquete, they actually cling to um, working class voters. So, so the, the relationship with labor is, is very contested. Um, but even then they have uh, sort of devices to, um, to placate their voters or at least to, to you know, um, to make it seem like they, they really are delivering. That's, that's one part of the explanation. The other is, um, so in terms of political competition throughout this period, um, the main reformist party that I was describing before, the, the coalesced around Adolfo Suarez that comes out of the transition, is not really a political party. It's just a bunch of people gathered around this guy who was uh, politically successful for a few years. But once he's in a bad streak, the party implodes. And that only leaves this sort of, this party called the uh, Popular Alliance, uh, it's formed, it's led by a former Francoist minister of uh, information and tourism, Manuel Ferraga. Um, and it comes across throughout the 1980s and even the beginning of the 1990s as a very uh, reactionary party, right? Um, I mean, most of its leading members come from the dictatorship. Um, they do sort of a very strong vocal opposition to, to PSOE, but, but they really struggle um, to, to capitalize on this uh, sort of uh, economic discontent. Right, uh, because they're they're very much seen as uh, an unreformed uh, party that came out of Francoism, right? And it takes it it's until the nineteen nineties when they eventually start moderating their their appeal, right? Um, and and this is something that uh, paradoxically in Spain, so you know, whenever the the uh, now they 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 even rebrand their name, they call themselves the People's Party, right, Pepe? So whenever they get to power, they always do that uh, because they moderate their appeal, right? The the two times they come to power in nineteen ninety six and two thousand eleven. It's after stints in opposition where they really uh, try to elevate their level of rhetoric in terms of polarizing and it doesn't really work. Uh, and it's through sort of a more moderate um, appeal. And because PSOE had to deal with the economic crisis in 1993 and, and 2008, of course, that they managed, managed to get back into government. So I would say, you know, the, the timing, the fact that Spain had a dictatorship and the timing of PSOE when it comes to office and the fact that it's like building up the welfare state um, and to be clear, even though like PSOE faces very similar contradictions to those faced by a party like the Democrats in the United States, they do deliver like, so they, they create a public healthcare system, right? Which is more than the Democrats have ever done. Um, they, they really expand public education. They really do deliver on these things for their voters. Um, you can say, you know, not as satisfactory as, as in, in, you know, as your model social democratic party for sure. But at least there is, there is reason if you're a PSOE voter that you can still cling to your vote there. And that's, so that's the one reason. And the other is the, the type of uh, opposition they get in terms of other political parties. Is there um, any kind of tangible uh, resistance to the kind of more liberalizing aspects of the PESOA's platform, either in the 80s or even later after that, um, before kind of 2011 and the Indignados? Is there a kind of uh, resistance that we can articulate or any alternatives to the kind of uh, more liberal side of their economic policy? Yes, there is. I mean, mostly from the labor union and then from a, sort of the coalition to the left of PSOE, United Left, is mostly led by the Communist Party, right? They come together. Their first attempt to like really come against the PSOE is with a referendum of NATO membership, uh, which they lose, right? Um, but then afterwards, they, they do start building a, a uh, you know, they do start getting more votes. They start strengthening their position. Uh, Julio Anguita, which is your sort of historic leader, comes, you know, there is a point where he seems like he's going to be able to mount a significant challenge um, to Pessoa from its left, uh, but it eventually comes to nothing, right? I mean, well, it doesn't come to nothing, but it's it's really the right wing that um, that wins electorally in 1996. 
Um, and then there is there's resistance from the labor movement, but I, as I was explaining before, really like PSOE has a sort of develop an institutional configuration where it can actually uh, ignore uh, most of this opposition on, on, a, on an institutional level, right? Once it gets to the streets and their general strikes, uh, things get more complicated and eventually that's what lead, uh, that uh, coupled with the economic crisis, what leads the party to, to lose elections. Uh, that's with the Gonzalez years. Later on, uh, I think really, yes, PSOE has become like, like any other central left party, very vulnerable to economic crises, right? So, so the 2008 one really, um, it, it just blew a hole in the party's credibility because they were facing re-election earlier in that year. And the then prime minister uh, from PSOE said, well, you know, this, this is crisis. It's not really a crisis. It's just a deceleration of economic growth. It's not really something to worry about. But of course, uh, uh, soon enough, it, it becomes something to worry about, right? Um, and so initially they tried to do, they try to react with sort of like Keynesian measures, stimulus programs. These don't work as well as they'd expect, uh, even though it's sort of the, the, a move in the right direction, but they're not as effective as they would like them to be. And then in 2010, they are basically, um, and the prime minister like tells us in his memoirs, which are very interesting, they are basically compelled, uh, they are coerced internationally. Uh, Joe Biden even makes a phone call and tells him like, look, uh, people only respect you if they are, I believe he says something like, uh, you know, blood and tears. If the unions break with you, that's that's when people will really respect you as a leader. Uh, that's Joe Biden in 2010. And they basically, you know, uh, not really, the United States doesn't have as much leverage as the European Central Bank um, and other European countries do, really. And they they um, they twist their arm and they force them into doing austerity policies. And then they lose the elections big time, right? They get like 28% of the vote in 2011. Interestingly, they get uh, really like, it's not like the, the right-wing party at the time does a lot better than the previous election. It's just that the central left uh, electorate deserts them. They don't show up. So they tank. And here, I guess you could make a comparison to like what happened in, in 2016 with Hillary Clinton, right? Uh, it's really, but, but on an on a, on a greater scale, uh, their electorate just doesn't show up because they're so disappointed. So yeah, today uh, they're in a, in a vulnerable position if they don't um, react to these economic crises in a way that uh, their base finds adequate. But of course, it's complicated because Spain is part of the European Union and it means that like really your space where we're enacting fiscal policies and having room for maneuver is really, it's decided at a European level. Uh, what happens in Spain is, is important, but it's secondary to what is decided in Brussels. So as you pointed out, yeah, the, the PSOE is in government at the time the crisis hits. Uh, Zapatero is the prime minister, you know, they implement austerity policies, they lose the election in 2011 uh, because their traditional electorate, you know, decides not to show up. Um, but unlike, say, the Greek Socialist Party or the Spanish, or excuse me, the French Socialists or, say, the Dutch Socialists, um, you know, this doesn't result in a complete collapse of PSOE. Um, you know, it looked like with the emergence of forces like Podemos on the left, um, you know, in the wake of uh, the, the big protests against austerity, that um, PSOE might be overtaken. Uh, and that they might go the way of the French socialists or PASOK in Greece, but that hasn't happened. Um, why is that? What are, what are some of the things that has prevented uh, PSOE from falling into that kind of situation? Is it have more to do with the sort of, uh, I guess, structural features of um, Spanish politics? Uh, is it uh, because of, um, you know, kind of the, the tactical or strategic decisions made by PSOE leaders, some combination of the two? Uh, yeah, what, what, what saves PSOE from, from that kind of uh, fate that uh, uh, the, the French and, and Greek socialists have, have, uh, have, have um, faced over the last decade or so? Right. Well, that, that's another question that I hope to have a perfect answer to in two years from now, but now I'm really grappling with because, uh, I mean, so I think there are a, a bunch of different variables and they're all very interesting. Um, so they they do um so they do all these austerity policies they're pretty blatant right um and, and they get trounced electorally for that but they it's interesting because if you read the the prime minister's memoirs they don't do them with any conviction whatsoever they just have no alternative and they have to do this right uh but out of sort of a sort of a loyalty to the european integration pro uh, project they feel like there's something they have to do uh they get trounced and then um in 2014 while they're in opposition uh, a new sort of left populist party emerges, and it seems like they're going to go the way of, of the Greek and French socialist party. They're just going to disappear. Um, for a couple of years, PSOE and Podemos are pretty much tied at the same, uh, roughly like 20% of the vote each, right? Um, and they're locked in the struggle between each other. Um, so interesting, I think here, like really, if you want to understand why PSOE managed to come out of the 
uh, out of the struggle and in a good position, you need to look at Podemos rather than PSOE, or rather the difference between Podemos and PSOE. And it has to do with the fact that um, so Podemos, uh, so they have this sort of like populist hypothesis, right? They have a very good, like a very strong communication um, message, right? In terms of like what went wrong in Spain, what are the ways of solving it? Um, so, so much more uh, antagonistic with the center left than, for example, uh, Bernie Sanders in the US, right? But another important difference is, unlike Bernie Sanders, they're not very much interested in organization. They want to win quick and fast. And they think if they have like a good message and message discipline and a like very tiny but like centralized and hierarchical party, in a couple of years they can do this. And it turns out they can't. They basically draw with PSOE and then they can't overtake them, right? So then your original strategy, again, it's a bit like the Communist Party before where you have like a strategic hypothesis that doesn't really work. In this case, it really comes close to working. And Podemos came much closer to overtaking a PSOE than the Communist Party ever did. And in fact, after the 2015 elections, if you add up the vote of uh, Podemos, the left populist party, and the, the, the traditional uh, Eurocommunist coalition, Izquierda Unida, they are more, uh, there are more votes there than in PSOE. So there are more votes to PSOE's left than in PSOE, right? Uh, eventually that, that stops being the case. But um, what happens is once they, they don't manage to overtake them in a, in a in a clear manner, um, they don't really have a backup plan, right? Uh, and they begin fighting between each other. Uh, the, the party leadership starts in fighting, which, you know, as any political scientist will tell you, or like a basic analyst, is like the worst thing that can happen to a party in terms of getting votes, right? If, if and, they, and, and like the infighting is pretty nasty and also public. So it has the worst thing of like, uh, like a, a, a very authoritarian left Stalinist party and like a, a Trotskyist organization where everyone is doing different things, right? Um, so, so like for, for a couple of years, they're just fighting each other um, and, and sort of without coming to any clear conclusion of what they should do. And meanwhile, PSOE, what happens is like you start realizing that they are better at clinging to their traditional basis of support because they have been a, a party that has been around for a very long time. And so they have like a territorial presence everywhere in, in Spain, right? You go to a small party, small villages in, in rural southern Spain, and there's like some PSOE infrastructure there. There's your PSOE point person that will tell you what the party stands for or whatever. Podemos originally has a lot of effervescence, right? There are these uh, circulos, the circles where people gather and talk and they, you know, they're linked to Podemos. But Podemos becomes so tightly run uh, and top down that it's so linked to Madrid that eventually people become very demobilized, right? Where in entire regions of Spain, they don't have any representation. And so this makes the party much weaker against PSOE. So that's like your sort of like structural explanation. Then there's a question of timing. Uh, Podemos does a no confidence vote against uh, the, the party of the center right. It doesn't really work uh, because PSOE abstains. It then PSOE does a no confidence vote next year and, and PSOE, uh, Podemos supports it. They also gather support from other small uh, like regional or pro-independence parties in Catalonia and the Basque country and they manage to get rid of um, Pepe, right? But at this time, PSOE doesn't have a, a very strong proportional representation. It's just that they get a hold on power. Um, immediately, their voting uh, chances uh, like rise significantly. And then again, uh, a bit like the, the right wing uh, in the 1980s, they are uh, assisted by the rise of this radical right party box. Uh, so that when you hold elections finally in 2019, uh, the PSOE has a very compelling message, which is like, look, either vote for me or, or the fascists are going to get into power, right? Um, because the center right is, uh, and they're sort of like uh, nominally centrist party, uh, Ciudadanos, that has now pretty much disappeared. They are open to uh, reaching an agreement with the sort of radical right party. And so uh, PSOE tells, uh, you know, its voters in the country, it's either us or, or, this, um, or this hard right party, right, that is going to be governing. Now, there are symptoms that that language doesn't work anymore, right? Because once you've used it, like you eventually exhaust that bullet or like you, you fired it and then you're done. But in 2019, it worked very well and it cemented uh, PSOE in like a clear leadership position vis-a-vis -vis all other parties in Spain. So, so it's a mixture of, you know, the, the legacy uh, of, of the party, the fact that they had like a strong territorial presence everywhere in Spain, right? Um, the type of opposition they got from Podemos, which is geared for the short term and to like, you know, dispatch them quickly because they thought they were really like about to collapse, but they didn't. And then uh, finally to just the, the sheer timing and, and chance, right? And appearance of other parties. So you have like a, a, a very mixed bag of, of structural factors and others that are just pure chance. 
And, and what is the role here? You know, people who have been following Spanish politics over the past few years will, you know, will know that one of the biggest issues in Spain hasn't been just, you know, in addition to the, you know, the fallout from the from the crisis a decade ago, it's the question of territorial integrity, right? Um, you know, there's the Catalan independence movement, some other regional independence movements in Spain. So this question of like kind of Spanish unity um, has has um, been very central to Spanish politics. Um, what role does this conflict uh, play uh, in, you know, kind of uh, on the Spanish left uh, and in shaping the fortunes of, of PSOE and, uh, and Podemos uh, respectively? Right. Well, so the, 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 the gist of the story is that Spain is sort of a very plural country, right? right? You go to places where they're, they're, it has several different languages, distinct uh, traditions, uh, and, and, and regions that were a significant amount of the population would like to uh, become independent, right? Um, in many of these regions, for example, in Catalonia, as a response to the crisis in 2008, there was a, a, a big rise in, in pro-independence sentiment, right? Now, Traditionally, in Spain, has been the right wing that has been very centralizing, right? Going back to the Franco dictatorship, which was all about scrubbing uh, the state clean and sort of like erasing every trace of um, of, of political difference, of, of, of a cultural and, and national difference within Spain, right? Uh, but they never do did this successfully, uh, and the left has always been more pro, uh, I guess, a states' rights in terms of uh, cultural autonomy, right? And and being able to develop your own language policies and whatnot. Um, and this has played differently at different times in Spanish history. So in the 1970s, in the transition to democracy, centralism was extraordinarily discredited, right? So the left, uh, by being, by having like more, um, you know, open to these, uh, these claims by um, nationalists in, in, in the Basque country and Catalonia and to some extent other regions like Galicia, uh, they actually, it doesn't really um, harm them electorally, right? Uh, now that changes after, after, um, after the crisis and, and the rise of uh, pro-independent sentiment in Catalonia, and basically what happens is there is a, an irregular referendum on self-determination. Uh, the government, the conservative government attempts to repress it. Um, the sort of like the, both governments in Madrid and in Barcelona are led by sort of like right-wing uh, reaction, uh, I mean, right-wing parties, conservative. Um, and so they're sort of at loggerheads with each other, right? Uh, Paradoxically, this is a dynamic that like benefits uh, the right both in Catalonia and the whole of Spain, right? Uh, because it's like a clash between uh, um, feelings of, of nationalist grievance and where the left really doesn't have much to say, right? It's hard for them. So Podemos had a sort of like uh, an ambiguous proposal. They wanted to celebrate a referendum and self-determination, but they would uh, lobby for, for Catalonia to stay in Spain. But, you know, in, in a moment of heightened polarization, this comes across as unclear, right? So they don't really have a, a clear answer in the way um, the right has both in, in Catal the Catalan uh, nationalists and the Spanish nationalists too, right? Um, so, so eventually what happens is, you know, to, sort of, to a certain extent, these two movements are just clashing each other and they exhaust themselves, right? I mean, the, the, within Madrid, there is an attempt to, like, rather than engage with the movement politically, the independence movement, they just try to repress it. This doesn't really work, right? They, they sort of basically um, dissolve uh, regional autonomy temporarily and then they, they um, they allow for uh, elections to be held again in Catalonia and they yield the same result, which is a, a victory of the pro-independence parties. Uh, so so there, it's sort of a stalemate, right? Um, and, and eventually like a PSOE basically managed to, just to, to come into power and then uh, sort of prioritize a more, uh, let's say a, a live in the live uh, agenda where they're going to avoid that. I mean, they're not going to be supportive of any attempt to move towards Catalan independence, including a referendum, but they will not uh, sort of like uh, try to like uh, aggrieve feelings of, of Catalan nationalism and they will try to like, uh, so I think it's it, it sort of like um, kick the can down the road strategy, but it comes at a time when both sides in the in this clash are sort of very exhausted because the clash really led nowhere, right? And this is true in, in, in Catalonia too, where you have like, basically a 50-50 split between uh, people who would like to remain in Spain and people who would like to become independent. And they, they, I think they're coming to a conclusion where they, none of them has the sort of like majority you would need to establish a consensus on such a, um, um, so, such a determining issue, right? Um, so, so they're just in a position where they're like, it seems to be a problem that has no clear solution right now. And they will just have to sit down and like, you know, uh, live in the live sort of, which is something that benefits PSOE and, and its attempt to like not, not hide in the polarization there. 
Despite the kind of uh, contentious uh, history between Podemos and, and PSOE, they've they governed uh, in coalition together. Um, and, you know, uh, that did give Podemos some kind of a capacity to influence the response to the pandemic and so on. Um, and so we'd love to get your your thoughts on on the coalition um, and also, you know, where where the left goes from here. Uh, what's what's in store? Right. I mean, yeah, it, Podemos made a big effort because first it governed, uh, the PSOE governed alone with parliamentary support from Podemos. And then uh, from 2020 onwards, right as the pandemic hit, right before they formed the first coalition government in the modern democratic history of Spain, right? Uh, so basically the thing is at this point, Podemos is uh, sort of uh, getting uh, roughly like half of the vote that PSOE gets, right? So PSOE was very harsh in negotiating the conditions to enter the government because it was in a position to uh, basically be able to, to ignore the, the sort of strongest demands from Podemos because they, they, they are, they have been benefited by the electoral cycle and, and Podemos is really like, a, you know, a lot of its previous support has been withdrawn from the party, right? So they're in a weak position. Uh, and so they got some ministries. The most important one they got is the Ministry of Labor um, and a vice presidency that originally went to Pablo Iglesias, who was the historic leader of Podemos. Well, I mean, historic for the party that appeared in 2014, but you get the point. The, the, um, you know, the, the more sort of like better known figure in Podemos. Um, he, he resigned uh, last year um, and, and now it's uh, sort of the, the, the Minister of Labor, Yolanda Dia, who is in charge of representing Podemos within the government. Um, she's not a member of Podemos, paradoxically, but she's sort of like the head uh, person there in the government. Now, uh, she's, she's a, widely assumed to be the next leader of uh, what used to be the space gathered around Podemos. And I say space gathered around because it has fragmented into a galaxy of different parties. I will not explain all of them because we don't have two or three hours. Uh, and it's like, <laughs> really a situation that changes every few months. So it's exasperating to describe, but basically she is the, the sort of like a, a candidate that all of them like. Paradoxically, she comes from the communist party, um, but it's very interesting because she has a very different profile from that of Iglesias. Um, and this also I think goes on to explain what I was explaining before, like where all these uh, very contentious projects like, uh, you know, well like Podemos and it's originally like more revolutionary stages or the, the bid for independence that, you know, they were like, uh, very much like people driven and, and that they commanded a lot of passion a few years ago. Now people have a, they're sort of jaded, right? Um, on the, they're, they're exhausted. And I think Yolanda Diaz has like a, a, a character and a profile that reflects this shift, but in a positive way. And what I mean by that is sort of like um, Iglesias was kind of like a firebrand, right? He's a very good speaker, very good at sort of like uh, rolling up his base, um, very polarizing figure, right? Um, but not really someone who was like particularly comfortable once in government, right? He had like a, a vice presidency and he was around, but like, it's not like he had a, he was not given a clear agenda within the governmental structure to enact. So it was a frustrating position for him. Diaz is sort of much more soft-spoken, but she's a pretty, uh, she comes from the workers commission. So the union and she was a labor lawyer. And so she's actually like, does have the technical know-how to know how to manage her ministry in a very competent manner, right? And she's very good at working with unions, but also even employer associations, right? So she's like much more soft-spoken, much more, you could say, even like technical or technocratic in her appearance than, than Pablo Iglesias, but also a very tough negotiator, right? Um, and so she's respected by, because of this, beyond this sort of like traditional voting base of the left, which would be the people who really like Iglesias, but, uh, you know, um, here she is like a figure that is less polarizing, but like um, that commands a lot of respect. So I think she will be the, the candidate uh, for, for I probably won't be called Podemos. I'll we'll have a different name because they they will, I guess, seek to form a broader alliance with with other sort of like um, green parties in Spain and and regional parties that are also on the left. Um, and we'll see where that leads. Um, I think if they don't uh, fall for the same sort of like infighting that they did in the past, I think she has uh, chances of of uh, improving the, the the representation they got uh, in the last elections, which is roughly around uh, twelve or thirteen percent of the vote, I believe. So I think she can definitely do much better. Now, it remains to be seen whether Peso will retain its sort of primacy. And, and really, the relationship, um, the best way to, to summarize the tension in, within the Podemos and Peso and the government is between the figure of, of Diaz, right? As sort of like the Ministry of Labor, uh, labor lawyer comes to the unions, and the, the Minister for the Economy, Nadia Calviño. She is sort of uh, clearly a technocrat. She comes from the European Commission. Um, and so she is very much more a sort of a, uh, 
social liberal figure, right? Um, I mean, she, she is like widely respected within, within Brussels, but uh, much more conservative when it comes to managing the economy, right? And, and you see this in the response to the pandemic. So one response that was very successful was the, the furlough schemes for, for labor, right? So people were like sent home, but they uh, maintained sort of 70% of their salary, roughly speaking, uh, paid through the state. Uh, and then once the, the tougher stages of the confinement were over, they could reincorporate themselves to uh, the labor, uh, labor market, to their old jobs, right? So uh, we've had a big economic recession, but the labor market hasn't felt the pain as much as it did in the 2008 crisis. However, when it comes to overgrowth, the figures are still weak for Spain. And interestingly, the budget that they've approved is a sort of like very, uh, I mean, it, it, you know, Spain still has one more year before the fiscal uh, rules of the EU are reenacted because they're suspended in order to better fight the pandemic. And instead of like going for a, an expansionary uh, budget, they've gone from uh, one that was uh, actually defined in, uh, by EU authorities as contractionary, right? They're, they're trying to like not spend so much, um, which in theory is the opposite that you would do in a crisis you were came to, right? Um, so that's where the big difference, uh, where you can see the difference illustrated and, and we'll see. Um, ultimately, like uh, it really depends on things that are outside of, of uh, Spain's reach or, or the government's reach, which is whether there are like new variants of the coronavirus. You know, if, if the pandemic comes back with a vengeance, uh, the government might regret going from, for such sort of a mild budget. If things go great, uh, they might have hit the right spot, but it's it's out there, you know? And, and but the, however, like the tensions between the, the much more orthodox uh, political, I mean, economic policies of PSOE and those of Podemos that are more heterodox will, will definitely remain there. And, and it's an uneasy coalition. I think they remain together because they realize they, I mean, they have a lot to lose that they, they broke up right now, right? And they don't want to do that. Um, but but um, it, it's a tough balancing act. And there are tensions that, that arise every, every two or three months within the coalition. Great. That seems like a, a fantastic place to wrap up. Um, thank you so much, Jorge. That was really, really interesting. Uh, you took us all through 20th century Spanish history. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, very, very insightful. Um, I hope you guys. Um, yeah, and uh, and and I guess uh, we'll we'll be in touch.